Hello, everyone. We're all very excited about recovery and we celebrate recovery because it's such a great feat to, to, able to be able to recover, to, to be able to say, you know what, I am sober for a day, a week, a month, 10 months, 20 years, whatever it is. And it's beautiful to celebrate. However, this is Break Fear, Find Freedom, and we have to have the hard conversations. What about all the people who relapse? And there's what is the rate? 95%, 99% of the people who come out of recovery, out of, out of any rehab, they last a bit and then they relapse. How do you deal with that? And how many people even lose their lives? Well, today we've got Richard Azuna again um, on our show and we're doing these series and it's been really a beautiful ride. So we're going to go down a dark road for a little bit, but there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And this is we always find freedom somewhere. So without further ado, let's... Um, chat to Richard and take this conversation where it needs to go and have those difficult conversations. Hello, Richard. How are you uh, today? <laughs> I'm well. Good morning, everyone. And ho hello, Karina. Yeah, this is, um, again, another beautiful day here in Southern California. And yes. I'm up here in, in the mountains and it's just so beautiful. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here because I believe that a lot of the content that that we need to share is so vital for for others in recovery and for me i've worn my heart on my sleeve and i've opened up my wounds and shared everything and this is another area that we can absolutely hit it hit a home run and be a vital vital part of others that are going through or went through a relapse and with the guilt the shame and all that encompasses that 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 thought. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Um, because it's it's like the, the beating up, the shame, the, the 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 feeling of unworthiness and and being almost dirty for something that and the labeling as well. You know, the the it's it's a it's. It's a terrible place to be, and yet so many people are there. Tell me a bit about, um, Richard, what happened with you? Well, it started where, I'm, I'm going to be honest, and I think this is maybe part of everyone's start of using um, a stimulant, okay? Okay the feel good, the euphoria, the, the high, the like, I'm mightier than anything. I can do anything I want. I'm great at this. I'm great at that. I can do this, do that, do this. But little do you know, no, you're just spinning your wheels and it's a facade. It's a fast facade that will lead you to nowhere. So I thought, going through my young years, uh, junior high, experimenting with marijuana, and later in, in high school, marijuana then was introduced to cocaine, crack cocaine, and then later on meth. So that chain of events locked me in to having a supply of drugs. Marijuana, I did not... I. It did not work for me. It, it, I didn't like it. It was a peer pressure thing because everybody around me was smoking. So, hey, want to fit in, want to do that. And it wasn't my thing. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd go a step up and graduate and do some cocaine. <laughs> and little did I know, once I touched cocaine, it would, it would alter the direction of my life, my course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, doing cocaine for the longest time. Now, remember, I was, I, I don't know if anybody knows, but back in the 80s, I was <clears throat> 80. I've always, I've always played drums. I've always played music, studied trumpet in, in school for three years and, you know, played keyboard, guitar. But my, my master is drumming. I played drums ever since I was, I think, four or five years old. Mm -hmm. And... As I was drumming, 
and cocaine and mixing, drinking, it started to wear its tie on me on, on how I could perform. I didn't know that everybody that was going to be in my world was going to be wrapped around cocaine. It was like this drug that everybody had. And if you didn't have it, you knew somebody that did. So I can say, and this is from the original question, I liked it. It was freaking amazing. And then I did cocaine, rock cocaine, and that took me on a total different ride mm -hmm. where I lost everything. Talking about selling everything that can possibly be worth anything was sold. Mm -hmm. Including my soul. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable to find the demon following you constantly and you feel the presence come on let's do a little bit more it's okay i'm your friend we're, we're gonna get through this come on with a wink you know and then I, I thought that um my my dealer was also selling meth it was actually called crank at the time dirty dirty bottom of the barrel crank And I wanted to get off crack cocaine and cocaine up for, for you know, I just, I, I needed something different. So when he told me that the high is different, you just need this much. And I was doing this much of coke. I thought I'd do the smart thing and do this much of crank. I was up for a freaking week, losing my mind, hallucinating. But I went back. Mm -hmm. And as the years went on, it got better, it got cleaner, it got more refined until all of a sudden you get this stuff called ice, the glass. It was just like crystal, you know, like it, it was just unbelievable. It went to crystal meth and it was just a, a, a cycle. But during my cocaine years in, in high school and even past then, I thought I'd quit every weekend. I quit every, every weekend. I was, I was quitting drugs. Okay. I'm done. I'm selling everything, throwing everything out the window. I, I, I would be clean maybe a week. And then all of a sudden get really antsy because of the weekend, I don't know what the weekend had to do with anything. And then all of a sudden I find myself every single day, years on end. So there was no weekend. There was no Monday. Every day was a party day. Every day, it, did, it didn't stop. I was, in a continue, I was at a continuous party. It was just insane. Tried to quit so, so many times, Karina. I could honestly say probably about a thousand times I relapsed. And I make it clear on my, on my, on my site that, you know, I'm going to be honest with you people. It's not easy. You, you, you were joining forces with the team of men and women in recovery. It is not an easy road, but if you are determined and you are focused on changing your life, then you're going to have to take some of the hard times to get to that point, to break through that glaze, to break over that, you know, to break through that glaze over and break that yoke and get through and it's a lot of times right before you get to that part where you're just ready to bust out and get to the next level of sobriety where you're feeling a hell of a lot more confident of the steps that you've been taking, a lot of people don't make it. They go back. What um, I'm just going to um, stop you there for a moment, um, Richard. What is it do you think that, that makes people go back? Because even, you know... A few days, one day, okay, it's one day at a time. Okay, I've done one day. I've gone through one day. Oh, thank you. The next day, thank you. And maybe a week. What is it that just triggers that I can't do this anymore? I need my fix again. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I can speak for all. They may be able to recognize and relate to me, but for me, I was, anything would trigger me. 
you know, something going on at home or I just, it was an internal feeling. God, I love that feeling of cocaine in, in, in a drink. That's where I love to feel. I love to be on that level right there. So I go, okay, yeah, I'm going to go out and get one. I'm going to go out and get a, get a 20 of, 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 of Coke or half gram, whatever. And then all of a sudden you find yourself, you're in hundreds of dollars and you're, you're out of money out of, you're out of your own dignity, the shame, the guilt. It's, it's the guilt and shame that spin around. So for me, anything that would happen would trigger me, but it was mostly inside of me that my chemical in my chemical balance inside something just went up. Boop, okay. I'm gone. And I was off and running. I was also at the moment in time that this is when everybody was aware in my family what was going on. So trying to hide it from them and then getting caught and then trying to stop and then relapsing, all of a sudden the guilt stacks up guilt after guilt after guilt after guilt because you've gone through it and you know that they're disappointed. You know that they're, they're on to you. And then all of a sudden, it starts spreading like wildfire across people that you know, friends, family, neighbors, especially when you have the garage open and you're, you're partying openly because you don't care. Mm. Yeah, that was me. Mm. This is what I'm doing. I don't care. And it was very, very, very difficult. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you know, relapse. And I, I may get some I may get some flack on this, but I'm not sure. But I believe truly from my perspective, from that my relapse was part of my recovery. It was part of, of the game. How often do you find someone that's been using for 35 plus years? without a relapse in there somewhere, somehow, sometime. I don't find that possible. So for me, personally speaking, relapse was absolutely part of my game, part of what I had to go through in order to get to the point where it was just done. I was done. I was emotionally, physically, mentally spent. A shell of a man. Nobody wanted me around. I couldn't even go to my family, my grandmother's. I couldn't do anything. I was left at a meth dealer's house in a trailer full of trash and beer bottles and a bag of meth for work that I was doing. That was the end of my train ride. What does, what, sorry, sorry, Richard, what determined that? Because you were going through relapse, and, and I know it's different for everyone, but maybe someone can resonate. Um, what was the, the thing that said, finally, you know what, this is enough, is enough, is enough. I am not relapsing. I'm not doing anything anymore. I'm going to save Richard. Rather than blaming, I'm sure you were blaming the whole world for your, um, your substance use anyway. You know, that's, that's a good point, Karina. Um, I think my case, I believe, is a little different because I didn't, like I said, I at, at one time, I loved it. I loved being on meth. I loved being on coke. I loved drinking and, and, and getting to that like level feel. It was like a, a, a balance game, you know, to keep that one up, to keep this one up. I truly enjoyed it until I didn't. Mm. And so I didn't blame anyone, you know, for me, personally speaking, I didn't blame anyone. Now, keep in mind, I went through a couple divorces, I lost custody of my kids, I couldn't see my kids. So that set in, but I didn't blame them because I couldn't be around them. I couldn't even see them. And I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to stay clean long enough to do it. So I I just sunk into this darker and deeper depression and I blamed me. That's where the, that's where the difference is. Um, 
I know, I know the game as far as going through it and, and, and maybe someone blaming another. And I say, there's nobody to blame but yourself. Mm. Now, if you flip the script and on your road to recovery, there's nobody to thank and there's nobody that is greater than you on the road to recovery because you are doing it day in and day out. Yes. You take responsibility. And I took responsibility for that. Absolutely. I had to. And that was part of my healing process was I had to learn how to forgive myself for being who I was for being the person that nobody wanted to deal with because I was just that guy. Now, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of arrows that are slung at people throughout the course of life. You're no good. You're worthless. You're going to be just like your dad. You're going to be just like this. Who, you know? And so you, you begin to believe all that. And I believed all that. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I took that all in. But I didn't blame them. I just, these are the seeds of negativity that were <clears throat> planted in me that I felt that I couldn't shake them. They were like little leeches on the back of my neck, just there all the time. Mm -hmm. So on my ride, it was, it was relapse after relapse until my bitter end and i i believe we we spoke of this and for those of the the new ones that are going to be watching this you know my end of the road was losing my grandfather and i i truly believe that the spirits above the the universe and my grandfather had a hand in this because i i completely stopped i completely stopped cold turkey done over and I went through the withdrawals for, for weeks, the cold sweats and going through the, you know, the process. But never did I think about going back out and going to do anything. I think I, I, I was able to reach the end of my line. This was the last stop on that train ride. Mm. I had to get off. Mm. I had to get off. There was no other, <laughs> there was no other stops other than death. And I could not do it. I could not do it. And I had to do something. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I love the fact that we can sit here honestly with an open forum to share with all the good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. days of drug and alcoholism. And don't keep, don't, don't, don't forget the mental illness anxiety as well in their playing its part the unchecked trauma for me growing up and unchecked trauma that i was going through that was never captured or i never looked at it that way who knows had i had therapy as a young as a young boy would i be in this position i don't know i can't turn back time mm -hmm. but i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing because had i not gone in the direction that I went on and I was able to get therapy and get help then, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. Yes, yes. So yes. there's a reason for everything and I'm very grateful for the time. Listen, you know, I'm very grateful for the time that I was put out there. You know, the universe picked me up, placed me out there, boop, there you go, survive. Oh, by the <laughs> way, you have it, by the, by the way, you have a drug habit, you have an alcohol problem and you have mental illness and you've been abused growing up. Oh, thank you. Thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah, I'll carry that around <laughs> with me for a while. But, you know, I try to go, and I think you know this, Karina. I love to put a little bit of humor in it because that's that's what keeps it, keeps it alive and keeps it palatable, you know. Mm, mm, mm. I would never want to get into that dark place of depression and say, talking about anything, that there, there has to be a spin of, of, of this here. But I want to share with you, anyone out there that is going through this and you're looking at this YouTube video and you're looking at this podcast, you're not alone. You are not alone. Mm -hmm. I get messages 
constantly from contacts I have on Facebook and Instagram that I'm in contact with them after they relapse and I make sure that I'm with them and uh, talk to them and make sure that it's just so important that somebody is there that cares and listens rather than shouting at them, putting them down, tearing them down, breaking their soul, breaking their spirit, breaking their reason for existing. That has to be the worst. And I've gone through that. So nor would I ever shame anyone. I would never put anyone in that position that I was in because I know how it feels. I want to be able to turn it around and give it a different approach of love and understanding. And they're on their hour, two hours a day. That is something to be excited and grateful for. Because one, you contacted me. You acknowledge it. You contacted me. You let me know. And now I'm talking to you and I'm trying to praise them for the time that they have. And I let them, I let them know yesterday's gone. Yes. yes. Yesterday's gone. What you did is phenomenal. You called me today. You have 24 hours clean. Let's do this. Yes. Let's stay in contact. Yes. Yes. What can I help you with? Yes. Um, I love that because it's, it's very easy because also, you know, looking at um, maybe a parent or something, sometimes parents lose their, their track or husbands or wives or spouses or whatever, or family. They, they feel like they, they can't cope. They don't know what to do. So instead of putting out love, they put out fear, which means that there's, there's, there's the, the reprimanding, there's the blaming, there's the shaming. There's the, and, and what it does, it just, it just makes you shrivel up and just go do the thing that you afraid to do that they afraid to do, that you'll do and i mean i'm not and I'm, I'm generalizing of course everyone's different but just generalizing in the general sense of what you were speaking about so i think we need to take a step back and realize that substance use is a disease it's it's something that's very difficult to 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 do on your own i mean you can you have you've proved it but why should you when we can use love and with love and support and hold each other up, even just listening to someone or just knowing that someone is there that we can speak to or DM or whatever it is, makes that difference. And we realize, again, you're not alone. Right. Um, so, yeah. so um, and again, we'll go, we'll go back because we were speaking about relapse at the beginning. It's so easy to blame someone and to say, oh, look at you. How could you relapse? What is wrong with you? You're weak. you this. you that. And to name call. Whereas, you know what? How would you be in that situation? You don't know. You're not in those shoes. So maybe it's about consideration, a bit of empathy, and just support and know that, you know what? It happened. Let's hold you, hold you up and let's see if we can do this together, just like you were saying. So thank you, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Karina. You know, it's um, I've I've done the same thing when my son was going through what he was going through. So I was living my I was living my horror over again. Mm -hmm. But I gave him the understanding and I and the love because I understood once that once the claws were in you. And they have a hold of you. It's hard to let go. And I get it. So I sympathize and I had empathy for him. But I also gave him love. And though there's only one time. And I mean, really, this goes for anyone across the board. If you disrespect me, I will disconnect from you. Yes. But if you want my That's help, fair. I'm going to love you. And I'm going to help you as much as I can. I've given you all the resources. I've given you my time. I've given you my my, my, my heart and soul, my, my opinion, my thoughts, and I've been there for you. But wait a minute, I'm doing all the work. You're not doing it. Wait a minute, I can't do that anymore. Sorry, I can't do that. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, the love and the opening of arms to welcome them in and bring them in to say, it's gonna be okay, I know what you're going through. It's something that I think people need to hear, man, because we lose so many people. And it just reflects to me going back where I two or three times, two times to get a call from the hospital. I had to go pick up my son because he overdosed. 
Mm. And because he was feeling so bad about himself, he was feeling so low, he was feeling worthless. And I couldn't stop that. All I could do was praise him and let him know how special he was and how, how amazing he is and what great qualities that he has. It's just you don't see it. And here is the kicker. Everybody on God's green earth has a season. And that season of healing is going to come when it comes. That I do know. If you try to force it, grab someone, throw them in a cage, throw them in a rehab, yeah. throw them into yeah. a mental yeah. ward, it's not going to work. It's got to come. And there's no reason, rhyme. There's no sense of it all, but there is a season in everyone's life that that season comes in to where all the doors start to open. The realization starts to click in and the thought of moving forward in on the road of recovery sets in. That's what I truly believe. Mm -hmm. Um, again, um, I agree with you because it's it's it, it, that's why we say the hands are out, outstretched. You know, if you need someone, ask, and um, the support is there. But it has to come from from the person because um, how many times people relapse because they're thrown into rehab against their free will? Um, and again, it's something that you, as the person going through me, um, going through my substance use story or whatever it is i have to decide as that person whether i want to be whether i want to stop it or or not i mean for you richard if someone had said before you had decided um you know what enough is enough i'm choosing myself if someone had said to you, you know what richard you have to go into rehab and had put you in rehab you it wouldn't have worked right <laughs> Karina, I don't know if you read my book, but I'll, I'll tell you, yes, exactly. In the 90s, I was at the peak of my cocaine use. I think I was winning awards every year. Every month I was winning, a, winning an award. The man to consume the most rock cocaine and do the most insane things. That was me. I come walking home to my grandmother's. My mom's there, my grandmother's there, and there was an intervention. And they shipped me up to Lancaster, California, into a men's group home re rehabilitation. And it was kind of against my will because really it was either that or the streets. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. I didn't want to stop using. OK, so, yeah, I was thrown into a rehab. It was a Christian men's home. And when the pastor found out that I can build I can do tile. I can do everything. He, he was having a home built on the property. So I was the one basically running it every morning, running the crew, running the guys that are in there in rehab, showing them a trade, how to tile, how to paint, um, how to do plaster, how to drywall, you know, how to do all these, um, all these sites. But it, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, and I'll get to that story because what happened from that rehab down the road, you're going to love. So I was used, and I was never able to get into the process of healing, so I wasn't in the in, into the studies. I wasn't into the meditation. I didn't have to go to the group meetings. I didn't have to do anything because mm -hmm. I was, like, part of that. I didn't have to do anything, so my, none of the rules applied to me. But then all the guys around there, it was getting really hard for me because they knew that I had favor with, with the pasture. And so all of a sudden, when he found out that I played guitar and drums, I was I was doing praise and worship, playing guitar. And then all of a sudden, I was doing um, the mixing because I had sound experience. And so I got to travel with the Trinity Broadcast Network when they were doing the outdoor events. So I was working camera, working gapping. I was with I was with the crew. So I got to do all kinds of things that I, I didn't get the help. 
you know, and lo and behold, when I left there, one of the, one of the, um, one of the members there knew that I was leaving. He had a house there in Lancaster. He said, man, he goes, look at, I, I know you're going to be leaving and this is your time and you don't have to leave. He goes, I go, I go, no, I have to leave. Mm. He goes, well, I know that you're getting GR. I can have your GR sent to you, maybe to my house, blah, 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 blah. But it was all a setup because he was privately using rock cocaine the whole time in church. So when I got to his house and he came home one night, the game was on. We cleared out his house, <laughs> sold everything. So that goes to show you part of the relapse and part of the program is pushing and, and, and doing that. This is why the season comes at a time that you do not know of course you're wanting it of course you're crying and breaking down and saying all i want to do is be clean yes we all want that but when we try and we're going over and over and over and over there's a there's this dark cloud still until that season comes and washes the storm away then and only then can you see clarity and see the horizon and see your future. Now getting back to that story, as I was training these men, there was a dad and a son that came in. They were there already, they were friends with the pastor. Very young kid, probably 16 years old, I believe in, in the program. His, his dad was there, a 50 year old guy, looked much older than his age. Mm -hmm. But they were they were ex heroin addicts, and if you didn't hear me correctly, yeah, the sixteen year old was a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. I kind of took him under my wing and, and gave him special favor and you know gave him, showed him how to do drywall, showed him how to do plaster, mudding, and how I do it, tiling. He was so grateful. And I remember leaving. He was one of the kids that came out and hugged me and cried and asked me, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave me. Jump forward into my sobriety. I'm in Lancaster at Home Depot, have my own business. I'm picking up a bunch of material. And I hear my name, Ozuno. And it was that little kid that I once mentored that came running down the lumber aisle. I didn't know who he was. Tattoos from here down all the way, big guy. He did a lot of time in prison. Mm -hmm. But also on the time off, he became a union drywall installer. Mm -hmm. So he grabbed me, he goes, I thought I'd never find you. I want to thank you so much for never giving up on me and showing me. And it's because of you. Because of you, I have a life. I have a wife. I have a kid. I have a job. I have a career. Talk about a grown man breaking down in the middle of Home mm -hmm. Depot where men are supposed to be men. <laughs> I was truly touched. And that goes to show you, I don't, I don't regret going there because something great came out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So you just don't know who you touch. And when you're, when you're relapse, when, when you relapse, that is the most important time that someone is there for you. Not to do it alone not to walk the battle alone because a lot of people are out here waiting for you to message and say, Hey, what can I do? You know, what do you need? What, what can we help you with? You know, we're having a meeting tonight or maybe we can come meet with you privately or let, let's zoom or let's, let's have a call. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? You know, keep in touch. So the stories that I share again with relapse, on, on my page, um, I'm honest, you know, I let people know it's, it's a difficult road, but if you want it, you'll do it. I look at it this way, whatever I wanted dope wise, I found a way. 
whatever I want to do in sobriety and earning business and doing what I need to do to sustain life, I put my whole heart into it. I put my time and effort into my sobriety every single day. Every moment I wake up, I'm so grateful that I, I, I get to have another day. And um, yeah, it's, this is such a, an amazing topic to, to discuss. And I know we're going to be able to reach a lot, of, a lot of people that are needing to hear this. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, as you were speaking, I just um, I, I want to go back about saying how you just loved, loved using um, cocaine, rock, um, cr rock cr crystal meth. You just loved it. So you just had this passion for it almost. Um, and now you 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 sober, right? You sober for twenty one years. So we have to say congratulations again for that. <laughs> it's it's yeah. an amazing feat, right? You, you, you know, it, it's like it's twenty one years and three months coming up, and I can't. It, yeah, it's it's just it's just amazing again for someone like me who was so helpless, hopeless, and didn't think anything of himself. I didn't love myself. I hated myself. I didn't like anything about me. And it's just so beautiful to see me again. Because I haven't seen me as that other person. And it, that's the beautiful thing. It's like... I. I, I, I'm referencing somewhat to this metal band where it's hello, hello me. It's the real me is looking in the mirror and the other vision. And I look at that as me looking at me as I am now looking at who I was then speaking to the old and saying, Hey, we had a ride, huh? We had a time, but I must dissolve you and you must be a dust particle in the wind and no longer return. Um, and that yeah, right there is a beautiful vision, right? Yeah, uh, it, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's, I, that's how I see it, you know? So now I'm going to go up to the question because I have to ask you this question, right? So we'll go back and you're saying how you love this, um, but now as, again, you're 21 years um, sober. Yes. What have you, what have you done? Because you've done a whole lot of healing and we've spoken about that. You've done a lot of, of, of um, counseling and whatever. What have you replaced in your life now as passion? What, what are you passionate about now? Because obviously oh. you needed, because, you know, um, if you, if you and, and I'm talking generally, okay, I'm talking from my experience, usually people who, who start using are, 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 are so creative, are so afraid of being themselves, or so they really, you know, you, you, they don't like themselves, you don't like yourself, you hate yourself, it's, and, and, you, and you're using to hide almost, right? And a lot of times you're using because you love the high. I mean, excuse the pun, but you love the yeah, yeah. adrenaline rush. Oh, so, yeah. And now you're 21 years clean, and of course there's also trauma and all that, but I'm just doing it generally. Now you're 21 years clean, so what is it that you're passionate about? Because now you don't have to use you don't have to use to get that high. You can find it naturally. That's what I'm getting to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you, my first thing is I, I love coffee. That is my stimulant. That is my, my, my morning. And at night I have coffee as well. I kind of lessen my, my blend. So it's not as strong before, but I think being able to stimulate myself in the work that I do, staying busy, staying creative, because again, being up here and being able to have a vision come to pass, and now I'm putting on the final touches, that was my high. Now, yesterday I went to the rocks hiking with my tripod, and I'm walking through these rocks, going to the top of the rocks, doing my thing. That right there is my passion. My passion to inspire others 
That is my purpose, my purpose to inspire my son. That is my high, that is my purpose, that is my drive. My vision for the future is to continue working, creating film content. My passion, I finally got back because now we're in pre-production. We're actually sitting at the table editing. These are passions. And I love the fact that I'm able to have that high doing it. And I, now that I'm up here, I'm able to change out, take a look at my wardrobe and start setting a tone for my next two photo shoots. <laughs> nice. The passion, the, the drive, everything has come back. And that right there is the replacement of what used to make me feel the euphoric feel of snorting that line of cocaine, snorting that line of meth. Because that was only temporary, then you needed more. Well, see, I can have the abundance of all the highs that I have now and all the things that I do, and there's no end. And it's not bad for me. <laughs> That's, That's the whole point, is, is finding that place. And Karina, I, I got to say, this is what I speak of on my... When I mentor, I let, I let people know, I, 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 I let them know, I ask them, what passion did you lose in your younger year before you got into your alcoholism, your drug addiction, or before mental health and anxiety came in? What was it that you were so passionate about that you lost that you would love to get back? And once they find that, That's a starting point for them. And I let people know, never lose passion for, never lose the passion for the passion once lost. And I want to share this, you know, there was a gentleman, there, there's a gentleman that's been following me for quite some time. He's been sending me messages and because of what I've done in my film and modeling and being what I'm being, who I am on the motivation side and sharing my story. Mm -hmm. He's in recovery alcohol. He's a recovering alcoholic. And I was able to line him up with a photographer. I was able to give him the points of interest to get his steps going because he was, he did some print in his early years. He did a commercial. He was doing modeling as a young kid and got out of it. And he's always said, I wanted to get back into it. I don't know how to do it. Can I talk to you? So we talked. Well, all of a sudden now he's modeling. He's he's mm, now doing yeah, his passion. And another in another time, I'll read what he's written to me, thanking me for pointing him and giving him the inspiration to get back that passion that he once had. And that's again, that's what I'm here for. Is I want to be able to inspire others with with what I'm doing, what I've done, the relapse that I've gone through, the tragedies, the, the, the hell that I walked. But I also want to share with them some of the things that I'm doing currently so if people are interested, I can give them the right information and steps how to take, you know, moving towards that mark. So I think one inspiring another all the way down that network, that web all across the world is so needed in today's world with all the madness that's going on. Mm -hmm. We are a community of recovering addicts, alcoholics, mental illness, anxiety, whatever we're, whatever we, whatever we have. And only we understand each other. And the ones that never experience and the ones that never have went through it, don't know what it's like. They have no clue. So we are here for one another mm. through the good and through the bad. Mm. 
Yes, um, I love that. And, and as, 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 a, as you were speaking, um, that's right. And I think uh, we have to take a moment perhaps to, to just celebrate the lives of the people who, who lost their lives. Um, and, and so many re with, with people relapsing, um, you know, they start taking, they start using again, the body's not, not used to the same amount and, and, and they lose their lives. Um, so we have to take that into account as well. And hopefully with conversations like this, we can uh, become more aware of it and not have that stigma as well and the shame around uh, mental illness and um, substance use. So, yeah. Yeah, that, and, and, I, and I knew this was going to be a next part of, of our conversation, and that is, I think, the, the most hurtful and the most thorough part of all this is when someone relapses, and because of the, the potency of, or the lacing of, they lose their lives. And nobody knows that. And nobody knows, or nor could I say, was there anybody there for them? Was there anybody there to talk to them? Was there anybody there to be the wedge between using and, and then some slip under the radar very, very silent because they do it in silence. And I thought that's the way I used to be was I, I partied alone. I, I, I did everything alone. And if anybody came over, they went to my place or I would go to someone's place, but I would much rather be by myself. So that's the hardest pill to swallow is that is when someone is no longer with us because they decided to go, go try and maybe think like, yeah, it will be okay this time. And that time never happened. They never got through that time. And so for that, I believe, and I, I, I think you would agree that this, this episode here is a dedication to the ones we lost mm. and the ones that are still going through. And I think of my son, you know, could have lost him many times. And I feel very fortunate that I, that he's still here through what he went through. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So um, I think uh, before we end this episode, it's been quite a heavy one, but um, it, it was necessary. I think possibly I, uh, what I'd like to add here is let's break the silence because it's um, yes. it's it's, a, it's an it's embarrassment to say that you know it's you know someone in your family is is using or someone in your family may have mental illness or you have it yourself and because of the stigma and the labeling within society <coughs> you hide and you and you and you suffer in silence so let's break that silence and say you know what it's time to be become aware of what's happening so that we can, the only way we're going to make the change is first of all to change ourselves, but to actually throw back the curtain and to show everyone that this is what it's like. This is the ugliness, but the only way we're going to, to heal it is to show it and to come out and speak up. So. Yeah, good point, great point. And I believe that that, that says so much, you know, and breaking the silence. But if you look at the statistics, it is so, so different than what we're speaking because they have not been reached yet and they have not broken their silence. They've kept it to themselves. This is just, I think, one of the most memorable podcast interviews I've ever done. It is so hard to walk outside in such beautiful weather and knowing that 
someone somewhere is in an alley smoking rock cocaine. Mm -hmm. Somewhere, somewhere, someone is shooting up heroin. Someone right now is in their room with a blanket over their head because they don't know how to get out of their head. That's the hard part. Mm. Although we live every day because we want a better life for ourselves, I can tell you this. There's never a moment that goes by that I'm not thinking of others that are out there. And so to end that, this is why I broke the silence. I personally broke the silence and started speaking up. Especially when you're told to be quiet. Don't talk about it. Don't do this. Don't do that. You're going to bring shame to the family. You're going to... Well, I am one now that will not shut up. <laughs> and I will yell across the mountaintop for all in recovery and beyond that there is hope. There is life. There is life after relapse. There is life after addiction. There is a life after alcoholism. There is a life after going through, if you are on the right track of managing your depression, anxiety, but if you go with it unchecked, that's the hard part. Seek help, speak up, speak out, and you please, please break the silence. Tell someone. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Richard. Um, yes, this has been a, quite a, a deep, um, m m someone would say pr possibly dark, but I'm saying um, the message is out there, let's break the silence. And anybody out there, what do you think about um, this this topic? What w Have you ever experienced this? And what do you need to break the silence within you and finally see the light for whatever it is? Because, sure, addiction has so many other faces, not only what we've been speaking about today. So with that, um, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your, for your, your openness to, to speak about this, because these aren't easy subjects to speak about. Because again, about the stigma that society puts on 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 these these um, conversations. So yeah. thank you so much, Richard. This has been an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. And um, thank you, everyone, everyone else, for listening and being here. And again, tell us what you think and tell us your stories, because this is just a conversation between the two of us. There are so many other stories. Um, Let's break the silence. So with that, thank you. This is Karina. And bye for now. Have a beautiful Thank you, guys. Week. Okay. <laughs> thank you, bye Richard. Bye-bye, Karina. Bye. Yes. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.